Hello and welcome to OT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches. We're here to talk about time as well as how to spend it. My name is Felix Schultz. My name is Andy Green. Hi, Andy. How are you? Better now. Uh, I'm here with you, Felix. Virtually. Virtually. Yeah, it's, the, it's just the way now. Commuting. Yeah, it's a thing of the past. Do you know what else? One of the, the benefits of being able to call each other and not have to do this face to face. Not having to look at each other. I would have said that that uh, is quite a big negative, um, especially for you. But no, it means that we can invite other people to join us. Sure. Do you know who's joining us today? Uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. I wish. I wish. Austin uh, <laughs> Yeah, baby. Uh, no, we have we have another Austin. Oh. Uh, Austin Chu, otherwise Ooh. known as Horror Loop on the gram, as I'm sure most... Most of our listeners have come across his page. It's it's hard to miss. He's got, oh God, every single nice sort of big hypey watch that you can imagine from AP to Rolex to Patek uh, and then quite a few independents as well. Or they might have seen him in places like Hodinkee or he's probably been on Revolution. Uh, he he's, he's been around and uh, he's an interesting guy to talk to. So that's sort of the, the main course for today's episode. But Felix... What has been going on otherwise? Oh, look, I mean, I've sort of been, um, as they used to say in primary school, this is going to be one of those real Australianisms that I'm going to regret as soon as I say it. But I'm going to say it anyway. I've been a little bit heads down, bum up with work. So I haven't been particularly inspired in any, in any recent capacities. Um, I've just been, you know, tapping away at the keyboards. And that doesn't make for great podcast content. Do you know what it doesn't? Do you know what does make for good podcast content, Andy Green? Something watch related. Yeah. Given the nature of this show. Can you help out with that in any way? I can. Oh, I can. Parcel great. came. Parcel came a little while ago, and I've had some uh, had some decent hands on time with it now. So I'm I'm happy and I'm ready to talk about the it. The parcel, or have you opened the parcel? <laughs> I haven't opened the parcel. No, that's no, lovely. <laughs> um, <laughs> lovely recycled cardboard, uh, beautifully wrapped by FedEx. No, no, no. So the watch in question is from our friend uh, George Bamford. And my other friends at Good Life Clothing. Oh, it's a uh, it's a collaboration piece between the clothing brand and obviously Bamford. It's the GMT, which we've we've talked about before several times. Um, several times, you know, you might have seen the Snoopy, you might have seen the the one they did for Colette, um, uh, and other places. It's a cool watch. Already like it. This one though is is one that they did, and it's sort of uh, as part of their new denim snap shirt. Uh, kind of that they've released. So it's sort of a denim dial Mm -hmm. with a denim strap. Mm -hmm. Um, The one that I got, so there's two different variations. One's black and one's sort of brown with like macchiato kind of tones to it. So I was was going to say an espresso, but I I guess a macchiato is, you know, acceptable. Yeah, a little bit of milk in there, a little bit of milk in there. Um, In that grey matte case, which is really, really cool. Yep. I love it. I love this watch. The dial texture, look, I don't know if it's – if it's actually uh, denim, I don't imagine it is. I imagine it's sort of printed to look like it, but it's very, very well, you know, created. Mm-hmm. Um, Only so one that way came, to find out. Yeah, give it a give it a wash. Um, oh, no, you, you're not meant to wash them. Only put them in vinegar and then you put them in the freezer. Yeah, no, you can cold wash denim, mate. Um, but yeah, so you've been wearing that around with uh, with obviously the matching shirts. I'm very happy about that. Very happy to have that on the wrist. Uh, it's a really cool piece. I love I love the GMT. It's it's a really nice watch. Um, and it's cool to see Bamford sort of going from strength to strength. This is this like, one. you know, we obviously we talk about watches uh, off air. You know, we'll we'll send each other messages. We'll, you know, say, oh, I like this. Have you seen this? You know, what do you think of this? And if I can break the fourth wall for a second, sometimes we get real, Andy Green. Mm. Sometimes we're like, we do. Well, I'm not, I don't want to name names. I don't want to name watches. But we might say that is not a watch for me. We might mm-hmm. say that in no mm-hmm. uncertain terms. This is not the case with the Bamford X Good Life Automatic GMT. You have been frothing over it. He's been sending you pics. You've like, been like, I love this. Oh, it's so great. I just love it so much. I don't um, have that. I don't say it in that voice, but yes, I, how I, I do say nice things. <laughs> that's how I read all your text messages. <laughs> yeah, 13 year old Andy's got his first watch and he's talking to his big brother Felix yeah. about how much he loves it. No, yeah, I, 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 I like that. Um, PR 200. <laughs> Waterproof. Um, <laughs> no, I think you're right. And if and, and if I was uh, wearing that watch, I would probably go, Andy, this watch is great. It's 
really nice. Well, I'll have to let you borrow it um, next time I see you. You can no, borrow it. I, I think you'll like it as well. It's a good watch. It's not leaving your wrist. Well, look, if you're nice to me. Uh, but anyway, what we have to do is take a quick break and then make a quick call. Let's do it. Today's episode is brought to you by Longines, and we thought we'd do something a little different today and talk about their most interesting Longines technology, VHP. Felix, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew Green. Uh, now, before we dig into the finer points of why I dig VHP, do you know what it is? It's quartz, right? Andy Green. It's not just mm. any quartz. It's a very high precision quartz, and that's what VHP stands for. Makes sense. Why don't you tell me more? I will. But before I do, I have a question. Andy, do you think quartz is becoming cool again? I do. I'm sure not having a crisis about it. Oh, Andy. Uh, I, I agree. Now, you might be surprised to learn that VHP was first introduced by Longines back in 1984. It was pretty advanced technology back then. They've continued developing it over the next decade or so, and then they went on a little hiatus until they reintroduced it recently in 2017. Mm, so they've been in the high-end quartz game for a while now. But Felix, isn't quartz all the same? Quartz is quartz, right? Well, yes and no. Quartz is a lot more accurate than a mechanical watch, with the standard sort of quartz movement offering accuracy around plus or minus a second a day, which averages out to 15 seconds a month. The VHP does a little better than that, offering plus or minus five seconds a year, which makes Longines one of a handful of companies that can offer that degree of accuracy and performance in any watch, you know, let alone a quartz watch, which I think is quite cool. Andy, do you want to know how they do it? Yeah, that's really impressive as far as accuracy goes, especially for the price. Tell me, tell me how the folks at Longines put this together. Well, they haven't told me the details. A, because I'm not smart enough to understand, and B, I'm sure it's some sort of trade secret. Mm. But one of the main elements is the thermocompensated movement, specifically the crystal oscillator. This is the quartz crystal that gives quartz its name. Most movements use off-the-shelf you know, crystals, so to speak, while a thermocompensated crystal has been specifically cut and arranged to minimise the subtle differences that ambient temperature changes will have on accuracy. I'm talking like if you go into a room with air conditioning or you know, walk outside in the heat. That sort of stuff can have a you know, microscopic impact on how accurate your watch is over time. VHP takes that into consideration. If you want a more detailed explanation, Andy, you're going to need to find some sort of electronics engineer because that's as, you know, as good as I can do it. The other major impact on a watch's accuracy is, of course, shock. And while whacking a quartz watch against the door is less likely to you know, be catastrophic than with you know, a mechanical watch, the shocks can have an impact in the long run. VHP offsets this with a technology they call gear position detection system, which allows the hands to realign if they end up out of whack thanks to you know, a large shock or impact or even magnetic fields. On top of that, the VHP line offers a five-year battery life uh, along with a perpetual calendar as well as 50 metres of water resistance. Wow, that is, uh, that's some interesting technology and, and five years, gee, Felix, you can do a lot in five years. You can. You can do, I don't know, more in a decade, I suppose. Um, that's the tech side of it. But what does this mean in real life, Andy? Well, it means that the Conquest VHP collection is cool and it's, you know, not your average quartz watch. It's a watch that can handle anything you throw at it and literally not miss a beat. It's a great option for when you're doing something a little bit more physical or if you want a watch you can just wear and set and forget and not have to think about, you know, winding or, you know, anything like that, you know, on the 29th of February, all that sort of drama. Mm -hmm. As far as the collection goes... We're talking about the Conquest family, so they're pretty sporty. There's a time-only option, a chronograph, and a GMT. There's also heaps of options when it comes to dials and straps and cases, all the usual goodness. Sizing goes up from 36mm in the auto up to 44mm for the chronograph. The prices start at 1500 at the simpler and smaller end, and go all the way up to around 3000 for the carbon fibre dialed chronograph. They're sort of approximate prices Specific ones, head to longines.com. They'll, you know, sort you out. I recently wore the silver dialed time only model on a leather strap. And it was really solid. I quite, you know, I found myself sort of 
you know, not having to think about it too much. And I really also liked the detail and texture of the dial, which goes to show that it's, you know, Longines hasn't sort of forgotten about the finer design elements of a watch, even though they've been focused on the technology. I do want to shout out the GMT, which I think is actually quite a special watch. I was lucky enough to spend some time with it a few years ago in Rome, of all places, Mm -hmm. and I think it's one of the most solid travel watches I've ever worn. It's sort of a smartwatch, but it isn't. It's got this tiny aperture on the 12 numeral that reads your phone flash. So how this works, Andy, is you download an app and you can use the app to set the time. So you set your home time or your local time, you hold the phone up to the watch and it flashes like Morse code and the phone receives, I'm sorry, the watch receives it and sets it sort of automatically. It's really, really quite clever. Of course, you can use the crown, but I found the app to be, you know, idiot proof. Well, that's, that's a heap. That's a heap of value for the money. Uh, and those prices are a little bit hard to believe when you kind of break down just what you're getting. But uh, idiot proof is, is always good. Can't go wrong with that. As always, guys, a great way to support OT the podcast is to support our sponsors. Head to Longines.com to discover and shop the Conquest VHP collection. We'll link up these in our show notes and, of course, post some pics to social media. Uh, but we do appreciate the support. We will get back to the show. Andy, you know what else I can't get enough of? Uh, what's that? The fact that Austin has a custom IP. That's pretty cool. <sighs> that is pretty cool. Let's find That's, out all about we, it. Yeah. There's only one way to do that, Felix. How that? Speed dial. Felix. Andy Green. We have, uh, we have someone on the line. Uh, a lot of people will know him. He's got pretty famous wrists on Instagram. Mm. And if they don't know his wrists, then they might have read about him or seen him in places like the New York Times. Oh, yeah. Your Mob Revolution. Sure. Or perhaps more recently, in print, in Hodinkee Mag, Uh-oh. number seven, we have Austin Chu on the line, a.k.a. Horror Loop. How you going, Austin? Uh, you know, thanks for having me. It's great to be on this podcast. I actually was listening to a few episodes um, over the course of the past uh, week or so. And I'd like to say great job. Um, it's actually a great Thank podcast. You. And I'm very excited to, you know, start talking everything related to watches. And thanks for having me again. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. And and sort of mentioned just before we started, this isn't the first time you and I have spoken. I think we, we chatted back in 2017. You, uh, it was a very different time for you. And it's sort of a, you know, I made a joke to Felix before of, of sort of looking back at our first sort of interview of how it started and how it's going. Um, yeah. And gee, things have, things have been busy for you. Yeah. Um, I was actually, <laughs> I read that interview maybe 10 minutes before <laughs> this podcast. <laughs> And I was like, damn, yeah, things really have changed um, in just three years. But it, I guess all for the better. And I couldn't be more grateful and thankful uh, for the watch community and what this collecting, this hobby that we all call watch collecting has brought myself personally, right? Um, yeah, it's really interesting because I remember we, we did the interview, uh, I think over the phone or on WhatsApp and sort of talking to you and I mean, I remember back then, sort of thinking, wow, this this guy's got some some cool taste. He's got some really cool watches, and I and I made a list of the sort of the pieces that you had back then, um, mm-hmm. and it's sort of interesting to see that it was a, a moment in time for you as a collector, and to see where it's gone now. So you had a, you had like a crazy, you know, AP Royal Oak open work. You had a, a Nautilus fifty seven eleven, the you know 15, 15 400 AP Royal Oak boutique edition, a few Rolexes. I think you had like a Tag Heuer. Um, yeah. Maybe even some Panerai. Mm-hmm. W- yes. Where are you? Where are you at today? Um, I mean, what's what's really interesting is for for myself. I mean, you know, I remember when I was in high school and I was looking at you know because back then when I wasn't super into watches I, I loved watches I've always loved watches but I wasn't as nerdy as I am now um in that phase as I'm sure you guys all know because we've all experienced it in the very beginning of entering the rabbit hole it's really just appearances and aesthetics that scream out to you in terms of you know what watch speaks to you the most or what mm-hmm. design language or what aesthetic choices that the manufacturer chose for the watch right 
Um, and for me, it was straight off the bat, like ever since I was a kid, it was the Royal Oak. It was just, that was for me, the most beautifully designed watch ever. And I knew nothing about watches. I didn't know the price. I didn't know anything right. Um, at that point. And so, you know, my first luxury luxury watch, my first proper, um, luxury watch was a AP 15400, which I got for, I think 10 or 15% off. It was a blue dial back then. No one wanted them. Um, and it was just sitting in the boutique when I walked in and bought it and it was the same with the Nautilus. I think I got 10% off, um, back then, you know, people didn't like them. Um, Mm -hmm. well they liked them, but they weren't popular, right? They were just sitting there ready stock. Yeah. Um, something you'd never see today, but, um, yeah, those were the times back then, but right now my collection, I mean, it has evolved, right? Since the interview, I've gone through, you know, Richard Mill collecting phases when I was enamored by the brand. Um, again, before the hype, I remember I got a discount on my first Richard Mill too. Um, uh, but you know, I went from there to Patex. I got into Patek for a while, but then it, you know, all went full circle back to AP. And so now my collection is, I guess, 70% AP. Um, and the rest are, you know, a mixture between independent brands, Rolex, and Patek. And yeah, that's where I think my collection, I think it's quite stable in terms of the brand mix right now. And I would think that maybe in the future, it would be more 60% AP and 40% other brands. So, yeah. That's really interesting. I You've mentioned, you know, the first sort of proper, proper, you know, um, luxury purchase was that. AP 15400 before that how did it you know how did it start how did you you know become like you know when did you know you wanted to collect watches or get into this in a in a serious (laughs) way yeah well I started getting into the hobby of collecting when I was maybe like seriously collecting when I was able to afford it right because I've always liked watches I've been wearing a watch um, something something funny um, about my upbringing is many kids, they have like a safety blanket or like a safety toy, you know, like something mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. they don't feel comfortable without. They have to sleep with it. They have to be everywhere with it. Um, for me, it was a watch. It was a flick flack. Um, and so for me, it was like I, I showered with it. I slept with it. I did everything with it. It was it's probably it was probably really disgusting. Um, the actual watch because <laughs> I didn't have any um you know I wasn't conscious about cleaning it <laughs> at the time but um I wish I still had that watch but that's what got me that that's what really um gave me appreciation for actually wearing something on my wrist because back when I was a kid you know obviously we didn't have iPhones or phones like mobile phones like I didn't have one I actually used my watch for utility. Like it was sure. actually to know what time it was. And that just, I guess, uh, became a habit. And I just always wore watches throughout school, whether it was G-Shocks, swatches, whatever. But it wasn't until I was able to afford my first watch uh, after I started my first company um, that you know, it wasn't until I was able to afford it that I really got into mechanical watches. And I still remember what watch that was. It was the Hamilton face to face. I remember browsing mm-hmm. the internet and it was just one watch that screamed out to me. It was a price that I could barely afford, but it was still within my price range. And so I was like, fuck it. I'm 16. Oh, can I swear on this? Sure. Yeah, man. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, it's can okay. now. I was like, Yeah. <laughs> I was like, fuck it, I can't, yeah, I was like, let's just do it, I'm 16, like, you know, if I'm gonna mess up and spend all my money, or most of my money in one go, this is the time to do it, and so I just did it, and then, you know, I guess, just kept doing it, (laughs) just kept doing it, (laughs) just haven't stopped, and so, yeah, I'm here today. One of those things that, you know, you sort of see in, like, those advice, like, interviews and stuff, and I think this is really relevant, is what would you tell your 16-year-old self? So knowing what you know now and knowing what, you know, you've got now, what would you tell 16-year-old Austin who's just about to, you know, buy his first watch and get into watch collecting seriously? 
Yeah, so because of the echo chamber of social media right now, as a 16 year old, I'm sure if I were to go on Instagram, all I would want is a Royal Oak Nautilus and steel Rolex and maybe a Richard Mill, because that's all you see. Whereas before, Instagram wasn't really big, I guess, in the community. There were only a few accounts, you know, like Watch and Ish, like all of these accounts that we've all follow that we all follow. But back then, Instagram wasn't saturated at all with watch content. And there, it was actually very independent filled. And there was a lot of discovery. Mm. Whereas I feel like that has gone away right now. It's, it's fading. Whereas right now, you know, it's, it's different. You don't see... I remember back in the day, I would, every other day or every week, I would see a new watch or something I've never seen before and be like, oh my God, what is this? This is so cool. And yeah. I would spend hours reading about it. But right now, now, if you I post, 16, yeah, huh? now you post something new that, that people don't know what it is and they, <laughs> they just don't care. It's very different, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And so because of that, I think it will be harder starting now if you don't have the right information or the right guidance, because back then it was a lot more neutral. You know, it was you kind of pick and choose the information because the forums and all of that, there's no there's no algorithm that's that's tailored towards getting more likes and engagement and getting you to stay on your phone for longer. You know what I mean? Mm. And so on the forums, it was just people posting. It was just collectors having a pretty much a give or take equal voice in sharing their passion. Whereas now on Instagram, it's if you're not even for my own page, if I don't post a Royal Oak or a Nautilus or something hot, it just doesn't get likes, which I don't care about. So I still do it. But you know, like that would, it is really, that would, yeah, that would deter other people from posting it. If their light, if their livelihood was their Instagram, you know? Yeah. Really interesting. I want to ask you what, you know, you, I think you had different intentions when you started out sort mm-hmm. of your page and you, from memory, you were in a bit of a different business at the time, more working yeah. in like the luxury concierge space. Yeah. Yes. Do you still do that? Uh, no. has Instagram helped your business? Is it just fun now? Like, what's um, the deal? I mean, I started my Instagram completely honestly out of loneliness um, mm-hmm. in the watch community because growing up in Shanghai, uh, you know, <laughs> being someone that's already young in the watch industry, it's it was very hard to meet like-minded people, let alone people my own age that like mm-hmm. watches, right? And, um, yeah, that's, that's essentially why I started my Instagram because I wanted, you know, before I started my Instagram, I would be DMing all of these watch pages or commenting with my personal account and they would always ignore me Mm. and I would never get a response and I would even feel more lonely. I'd be like, shit, like I really don't exist. And then I created a watch account that was anonymous because I was like, Hey, maybe if I create a watch account and I start sharing, you know, my passion for this hobby, then maybe watch pages will reply. And you know what they did? Because if they see that you're a watch page, they know that you're a watch collector and they might give you, you know, a few minutes of their day. And so it just grew from there because I just got enamored with watch photography and it just took, it takes my mind. It's like a stress relief for me, stress release. Mm -hmm. Uh, It takes my mind off of, the other million things that are going on in my life and so while I'm taking photos of watches it just lets me relax and I'm just 100% purely focused on getting the best possible shot with the current lighting conditions and so yeah it it hasn't um it didn't end up I mean my intentions were not for it to actually grow to what it is now and my business uh changed dramatically uh back then when you interviewed me I was like a semi entrepreneur, I was still working for someone, um, mm-hmm. still learning. Uh, and um, I was a partner in the company, but I was still, you know, like minority uh, mm-hmm. shareholder. And I was still, you know, like, I, I was just working, right. And it was a crazy two years, I learned a lot. Um, but would I do it again? No. Uh, it was crazy hours. It was like, on average, like 16 hour days, it was terrible like 14 to 16 hour days. Um, but right now, uh, yeah. And so after I did that, I quit for a bit, became an entrepreneur again for a little bit. Uh, and I tried to start too many businesses last year and I actually, um, ended up not doing very well in a few of them, which is fine. Like you live and you learn, I'm young, 
um, everyone has failures. And so this mm-hmm. year I decided to focus on one business and this entire year of just being focusing 100% on this business. What's, so, what, yeah. what is that? I'm actually um, building, I haven't told anyone this, well, I, I mean, teased it, but I'm building a watch platform actually. Um, yeah. I'm, is this risk check? Yeah, yeah, it's risk check. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty much my, my, my aim and my goal and my mission is to inspire the next generation of watch collectors. Um, because in my opinion, uh, you know, the information and content that exists currently is great, mm-hmm. but it is not for 100% of the people that buy watches. It's maybe for 5 or 10% maximum of the people that are actually spending money in stores. <laughs> and especially for younger people, I mean, people that I speak to uh, that are my age or whatever, what's crazy is more and more of them right now, um, I mean, I'm young, I'm 23, I'm turning 24, but all of my friends right now, you know, they're working, um, they've been working for two years or whatever, and they can afford to buy nicer watches now and they're all messaging me, but that's crazy because they're young, right? And I asked them why, I've asked all of them why, mm-hmm. And they said that it's because, you know, when they were in college or in high school, they were used to wearing an Apple watch. And prior to an Apple watch, they didn't even think about, you know, the risk. It was just maybe like a few, like, I don't know, like back in high school or college, like music festival, like entry, like bracelets or whatever. They just wear that. It was wristband stuff, but it was nothing more than that. But because they were used to wearing an Apple watch, once you're working in a working environment, you're like, oh, shit, maybe I should, you know, upgrade. Um, because all of them say they really just use their Apple watch for health, um, and like tracking your heartbeat. So they just Mm -hmm. got Fitbit or they just double wrist or whatever, but yeah, they all want watches now. And so I just want to create a platform that appeals to them. The people that, you know, are used to lining up overnight for Air Jordan ones or Yeezys are now getting into watches and there's no content out there that really speaks to them in the sense that everything out there is targeted towards or at least framed in a way of supporting the sartorial man. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Whereas the new generation of people, you know, they they probably only wore a suit once in their life. Or, you know, like, they they don't wear suits. Yeah. or And they it's just nothing relates to them online. Because they're like, that's not me. The only thing that relates to them are celebrities that are wearing watches. But that's the most shallow that you can be in the realm of watch collecting of, oh, I'm buying this just because the celebrity has it, right? And so I want to create something deeper that, you know, speaks to them, but also at the same time providing a safe and secure exchange. So I'm trying to create a safe and secure exchange that uh, we authenticate all the watches on behalf of the buyer. And so the buyer won't get scammed. We hold the money in escrow for a maximum of three days while we're authenticating the watch. And so three days is nothing, right? And Mm -hmm. we make a fixed transparent rate per transaction. And so one of the hallmarks of the platform is transparency as well, because something that, you know, every watch collector pretty much, unless you're extremely lucky for some reason, has all, they've all been fucked over, screwed over in some way, shape or form by a dealer or by some other counterpart I mean, some other player in the watch industry. And so, but why is that the case? That shouldn't be the case. If you're buying and selling property, if you're buying and selling a car, well, cars cars are less straightforward than property, but you know what everyone's making. You know what the agent is making. You know what, you know your money is held in escrow. You know that everything's safe. There are lawyers involved. There are people involved. There are other third parties involved. Condition reports and all that sort of stuff. Exactly. Whereas with watches, there's nothing. There's no buyer protection. The buyer protection that currently exists does not work for international purchases. Is this like, is this going to be like gray old? It's going to be like, um, kind of, I mean, not really a little bit. In the beginning, we're only launching consigned pieces from our friends and uh, trusted dealers that we know. Okay. And then we're actually, again, I can't believe I forgot this, but we're actually opening a offline location in Landmark um, Atrium in Hong Kong uh, at the end of Q1 next year. Damn. And uh, that's going to be like an experiential, like an, ex- uh, an experience center, essentially, right? And so 
collectors can come in. Our staff won't be wearing suits. They'll be wearing really cool um, outfits that change every six months. And we will show you a curated selection of watches. 50% or 40% of the watches will definitely be hot models because it's just, there's nowhere where you can actually see the hot models all together, right? And so that's something that uh, will be interesting as well. But then the, the rest of the selection will just be undervalued pieces or pieces that are sleepers that we think, you know, are great collector's pieces, but for some reason the market doesn't give a shit about. Like, you know, like for example, the Neo Vintage Offshores, like mm-hmm. the Survivors, the Yarno Trulis, the Sebastian Buemis, the Barrichellos, all of these watches, mm-hmm. they're selling for around retail. How is that? Like, you know what I mean? Like they're selling for around retail or below retail or slightly above. But these pieces are, in my opinion, what perfectly embodies the offshore line and is when AP was extremely creative during those 10 years in the early 2000s. And so for me, it's like we'd also be showcasing pieces like that, but obviously not just from AP, from every brand, right? Because every brand has sleepers. And for Panerai, for example, we'll be showing bronzos and like stuff like that. And yeah, that's pretty much uh, the concept of Wrist Check. It's a holistic platform that uh, provides content, media, editorial, and also a platform for safe and secure exchanges. And so we don't own any stock. It's just all consignment. And um, the third part is the experience center that pretty much perfectly encapsulates all three together because everything is linked. You can consign your watches offline. You can pick up your watches offline. You can have it delivered to you. It's it's up to the customer. The customer is king. And so, really cool. yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, it's. Are you are you I mean, working with cool. anyone, sort of locally on this, or is this yeah. sort of just your? Yeah, your I have a. I have a business partner. We have about like 15, 16 people on our team now working on this. We just did a oh. five day content sprint um, and we shot about 200 watches. <laughs> like oh, wow. Crazy fucking watches. <laughs> like the content will be great. Um, I'm very excited. But yeah, stuff that you just don't see on the internet. You know what I mean? Like comparing the, like a detailed comparison of, for example, the open work perpetual. Uh, ceramic royal oak versus the non uh, open worked next to the white ceramic like you know like a uh, comparisons like this that you don't see or like a, you know, like like an rq resonance yeah well that's really interesting that you say that is sort of these comparisons because i mean i i still remember being in basel world and sort of you meet with certain brands and you ask for a, a novelty or you ask to see the you know the, the a, a watch that's specific to dubai or specific to hong kong mm-hmm. and the brands just sort of look at you and go why why do you want to see that we can't sell yeah. it <laughs> we yeah. can't sell it like in australia so you know not really well, so unless you meet someone showing it to you. You, you, they won't yeah so unless you meet someone really kind of with a really impressive collection or you happen to be traveling and, and bump into it like even as you know watch media that have been around for quite some time you just you don't see these crazy pieces and, he, and if it does come in at stock and you know the pieces that you're talking about just get sold straight away and never really surface again so the access to those pieces I find quite interesting. Have you um have you kind of got any local talent or any names, you know, writing for you or kind of helping with content that, that we'd know? Yeah, I mean, we're going to have a partnership every week with Celeb Watchbotter. Um, cool. It's like an official collab with him. And so we're just going to, this is like a weekly thing. It's just, you know, it's very simple content, but it's just people like reading it still. Mm-hmm. Um, especially the new new generation of collectors, they really care about this stuff too. Because even though in the beginning I said it's surface, it is very surface. Um, I don't deviate from my statement, but it is surface, but it is necessary in order to reel you in into the rabbit hole that we know as watch collecting. You know what I mean? Because that's that's how you start caring about it. It's like, oh, why are celebrities wearing it? Which celebrities are wearing it? Oh, what's this watch? why does it cost a hundred thousand dollars? And then you start Googling, you, you know, you, you fall deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. And yeah, um, so, yeah, like we're going to have a, a official partnership with them. So weekly, monthly articles. Uh, and also, I mean, local collectors, there were a bunch. Uh, I was, I'm very, I want to give a shout out to the Hong Kong watch collecting community for allowing us to shoot a lot of your pieces. We shot some really cool stuff. Like, a few first series like brass resonances compared to the brand new uh, one with the double remontois, um, the RQ and like stuff like this, they just don't see on the internet, like a T30 tourbillon Jorn, 
like videos and um, macros and all, you know the whole shebang of stuff in terms of content and uh, yeah like uh, it's been great I think Hong Kong is the best place to actually start something like this because man like you see taxi drivers in Hong Kong wearing Rolexes and they're real <laughs> and it's built into the culture here right yeah um, so yeah it's, I, I just want to take a take a back a step to something you were saying about how you're getting a lot of like you know DMs from from people who have come up wearing Apple watches and now want to sort of mm-hmm. um, graduate onto the you know something a bit more luxury and I, I, I find that really fascinating because um, I was at Basel when the, the 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 Apple Watch sort of came out was released and um, Jean Claude yeah. Vivre's line on it immediately was this is great because it's going to see a whole new generation get into watches. They're never going to stay with an Apple yep. Watch forever. Um, yep. And clearly that's, you know, come to pass and it's, it's probably a good thing for the, for the watch industry. But I want to sort of just take a, a second, like you said, you're 23, you've got a very different perspective um, in terms of what good content is and what you're, what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. What is it like to be a younger watch collector and have you sort of had to deal with, with challenges or any sort of... You know, people not taking you seriously, or have you managed to to have a very open minded, fresh take on it? I think in the beginning it was much harder. Right now it's fine. Right now, um, I think ever since my collaboration with AP, that's kind of solidified. That'll do it. <laughs> um, my standing in the watch industry, and so. I think ever since that, I think people, you know, there obviously were a bunch of haters like, oh, I could have done that. I'm like, yeah, but you didn't. So, (laughs) you know, like, so I don't, like, yeah, I I had the idea of Uber 10 years ago. I didn't fucking do anything about it. So I'm not going to be salty about it, right? Good on Travis for actually executing, right? So, you know, like, it's something that, that's something that still shocks shocks me like i mean 99% of the community were very congratulative but obviously yeah, you know yeah. there's a 1% that's like oh, like salty and they're usually the salty people are actually the younger people which is kind of interesting interesting um either younger or like much older um but i think in the beginning it was very hard because people would always just assume that because i was young i didn't know anything but the issue with mm-hmm. watches the thing about watches is it doesn't matter about age it's about the amount of time and the amount of effort you put into the hobby and it shows. And the thing is like, if you have a conversation with me, then you, you'll know that I, you know, I actually do love watches. I'm very passionate about them, but you know, with watches, as I'm sure, you know, if you're speaking to someone who's just trying to fake it, you can tell just like that. It's something, there's no bullshit with watches. Mm. It's like you either know your shit or you don't, or you're trying to learn your shit, but then your attitude is very different. And it's, you know, it's a positive thing, right? If you're actively trying to seek out more knowledge and I'm constantly seeking out more knowledge. Like I learn something new every day regarding watches. Um, Albeit now it's like more of the technical stuff and more industry insider stuff. But as I'm sure you guys know, a bunch of uh, stuff as well regarding that, but yeah, it's uh, a yeah. since the, since the collaboration, it's been very, it's 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 done myself a lot of good being a young watch collector, I guess. All right, well, let's talk specifically about that that collab in a minute. But what I want to ask, you, I want to get this question out of the way. Uh, we now know a bit about you. We know sort of the watches you're into and, and where you got to. I'm gonna say you own a lot of hype pieces. I have a few mm-hmm. que- few questions. Mm-hmm. Firstly, do they live up to the hype? Secondly, mm-hmm. are you sick of the hype? And thirdly, <laughs> is it is it your fault? <laughs> it's definitely not my fault. Um, okay, I'm definitely maybe sometimes a little bit to do with it because a few of the pieces, this is something that I... So with AP, a lot of the pieces that I own that are now hype, when I bought them, I was either the first or the second or, you know, one of the or the first good photo of the watch on the internet or one mm. of the first few collectors on earth or first 10, first whatever to get it. And so when I bought the watch, I paid for in these situations, I pay for the watch way before. You know mm. what I mean? I don't know if the watch is going to be hype or not. I don't give a fuck if the watch is going to be hype or not. I just like the watch. If it happens to be hype afterwards and it's like, sure, that's that's an added benefit, right? But 
then again, like answering the first part of your question or second part, uh, they do live up to the hype for sure. There's a reason why people want them and like them. And there's a reason why the collector, the collecting community at large goes crazy, crazy for them too. When you know, one thing that I want to add on to that, if the collect, if the collector community, like the purists and people on Instagram that, you know, all the super uh, subjective, opinionated people, if they all like one watch and the new generation of people that don't know much about watches also likes it just based on aesthetics, then it's just a good watch. Yeah, you know true. what I mean? Yeah. And so because of that, it's like, you know, there's a reason why people are paying two and a half times retail for the uh, open work black ceramic perpetual calendar. Like it is just everything that AP stands for and what they have built over the past, you know, since 1875 until now, you know, it's material innovation. It is uh, advancements with a perpetual calendar. They're the first brand to put it on a wristwatch with a leap year indicator in 1955 um, and open working. They were the first brand to open work a watch in the thirties after the great depression. And so, you know, it's like, it combines three hallmarks of the brand and four, the Royal Oak. And so it's like, you know, <laughs> what's not to love. And, um, yeah, true. Um, yeah. So how, how do you go from being a fan of the Royal Oak, you know, way back when, you know, buying it at a discount in a boutique to yeah. helping make, I'm going to call it your own, make, make your own Royal Oak. How does that, how does that happen? How well, first of all, it's a collaboration between myself and Audemars Market Day. Totally. Um, that I'm forever <laughs> humbled and grateful for. Like, honestly, though, like, I'm still in shock that it happened. Like, now when I look at the China edition, sometimes I'm just like, the fuck, this actually happened? I'm not dreaming, like, you know? Um, but honestly, my one answer is just, it's a one word answer and it's just passion. Like, okay. it, that's all it is like i mean i'm no i'll i'll elaborate i'm sure if i just finish off with passion the listeners will be pissed but um yeah it just start you, you build a you treat brands or i was lucky enough that i was able to meet the regional ceo at an event and then the regional ceo at the time and myself got along very well still a good friend today um and uh eventually met Francois but it was just I've never even when I was in that process I wasn't asking for any watches you know what I mean I wasn't like oh can I get this can I get that because I just treat it like a friend like is anyone if I become friends with someone and they own a coffee store I'm not Mm -hmm. gonna go in and be like hey give me free coffee or you know what I mean I'm gonna support him and buy coffee Mm. and the thing is with AP a lot of a lot of people, when they meet the brands, they only care about, oh, I want my watch. They're a brand. They're, they need to sell me this. And so that's all they're going to ask about. And they don't actually give a shit about the person or they don't care about the brand or they don't care about the stories. And I think that's where my approach was a little different because it was just purely from a passion perspective. When I met, when I first met AP, like the regional people, I couldn't afford a concept or beyond like you know what I mean but that's not what I even wanted at the time I didn't want anything I just wanted to actually learn more about my favorite brand and so I guess that's just how it unraveled and it just you know eventually led to a organic conversation between Francois and I um when I was just asking him I was like hey like you know you guys do so many, well, not so many, but you guys have done limited editions or regional launches before, like the Latin America, Rose Gold, uh, Perpetual, Pride of Germany, Pride of Siam, Pride of, you know, Mm. a bunch of places, right? I was like, you guys had one watch that was Pride of China, but let's be real here. It's it's not that great looking, (laughs) you know, the one that they did before. It was a two-tone, forgot the complication, but it was like a two-tone Royal Oak. Uh, that had the great wall uh, engraved on the back, or something. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, but, yeah. I'm just, I'm just, you know. And then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, to be honest, I think it's one of the ugliest royal oaks ever designed. <laughs> like, you know, I'm honest about that. I really don't like that watch. And um, 
so I was like, you know what? And, and actually, Francois replied kind of like, you know, just like the way he is. He's like, oh, well, if you're such a smart ass. Well, not really like that. But he was like, well, if you if you know, uh, kind of like if you're such a smart ass, why don't you propose something? But like in a jokey way, like he wasn't yeah, serious. Yeah. But I was like, fuck it, I might as well just try, right? <laughs> and so I actually sat down and I thought about what would look really cool in a watch. What would collectors like? What do I like? What do I think um, the Chinese collector base would like? And I just sat down for a few days. Um, I don't know how to draw on a computer. Mm-hmm. So I just compiled a mood board of colors. If you look at the mood board now, it's very gray, black, and uh, red. Yeah. And um, a mood board. And then I wrote, like, it was like a wrote out in an email, very detailed, like, what I would want to watch. Like, oh, like, gray dial. Um, the left subdial looks like this, right subdial. But it was all, like, written out descriptively yeah. in English. Yeah. And then sent off the email, Not didn't expect anything, didn't hear back for, like, three weeks a month I, I don't know how long it was it felt like an eternity um and i would text francois like hey did you see my email all that and you just leave me on du- like uh the blue double tick you just leave Ooh. me on red for like weeks and i was like <laughs> fuck scene. like did i yeah leave me on scene i was like damn like did i really design something that horrible and um then randomly i still remember i was actually on the toilet when i received this email um <laughs> I remember it was like a flashback, like memory or whatever. But um, I remember seeing the email and it was like, yeah, like it aligns with our brand strategy. Let's do it. And I was like, what? It was like the email had no subject as well. It was just like an email. It wasn't even like a reply to the original email. And it was that that was was like, let's do it. Was it like, we'd love to discuss it further? It was like, yeah, we're in. Just yeah, it was just like, yeah, it was, yeah, it was just like, yeah, let's do it. Like, it, it looks great. Like, let's do it. <laughs> so I was like, okay. But bear in mind, this was end of 2018 or like Q3 2018. And so, you know, the watch was launched January in 2020. So it took like a year and a bit to launch. And so during the first six to seven months, even though I knew like, oh, they said it was happening. I, you know, you never, I mean, I've worked with brands before, not watch brands, but at this point, but um, I've worked with other fashion brands. I've uh, consulted for a few luxury brands, like in not watch related. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, projects like this come up all the time. They nearly come to fruition. And then, oh, something changes at the end. They're like, you know, what? we're not going to launch it. You know, this happens all the time. Projects just get scrapped left yeah. and right. And so I was just scared. Well, it paid off, man. So it was 88 pieces, titanium. And I want to ask yeah. you, there was, obviously they all sold out, you know, in rapid speed, but you mentioned Celeb, celeb Watch Spotter. They actually spotted it on the wrist of someone pretty cool. Yes, that was that was pretty cool. That's, Who um, was it? What does he do? Ke- Kevin Hart. He is a comedian. <laughs> that was idea. really cool, honestly. Um, I mean, I was already like, it was really crazy, actually, um, just at the launch event itself, because a bunch of celebrities came, like A-listers and mm-hmm. all that to support, and they all bought the watch. Um, but what was, yeah, what was re- really cool was the next day after the event, after, like, you know, I was going to board my, I was uh, waiting for the car to pick me up to send me to the airport to fly back to Shanghai, because the launch was in Beijing. And... I checked out of my hotel room and the Mandarin Oriental in Beijing is literally next to the AP boutique. It's like right next door. Um, And so while I was waiting for the car, I had like 30 minutes. I was just like, I'll just wait in the AP boutique. Right. And so while I was waiting there, there was like this old ish guy that came in and he was picking up his watch. And I looked over and I saw the red box and I was like, damn, he's picking up the China edition. Right. So I was really happy. Like that feels so great. Like someone spending money buying something that you had a part of um in the design process or whatnot and what was crazy was he actually spotted me and he asked for a photo and he asked me to sign his box (laughs) that was really cool so he asked for a photo and he asked me to sign his box with a sharpie and that was really (laughs) really cool and um but yeah that was surreal i was very hungover at the time but it was great (laughs) but uh, but with kevin hart i mean 
I, I'm still speechless that he owns it. He even did a few commercials with it on, like wearing the China edition in commercials, um, which Very is really cool. cool. Um, I heard, I heard, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that John Mayer bought one too, um, which would be fucking crazy um, if he did. But yeah, shout out to Kevin Hart. I mean, glad you like it, man. Yeah, he, de- <laughs> he definitely listens to this. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you never we'll know, you never know. Uh, yeah, you do never know, I guess. But hey, you followed me on Instagram, so... Hey, <laughs> oh, that's, that's cool. <laughs> he knows. He knows what's up. Uh, so, the, the, you know, obviously, um, China is an important mar- market for watch brands. And it's yeah. something that you hear a lot about. Like, you either hear that, you know, it, it's going to save a brand or, you know, it's it's all the profit to going there. Or you hear that, you know, the reason that no one can get Daytonas is because they're all going to China, all this sort of stuff. What's your take about on the Chinese watch market and how it's changing and evolving and the, what the global perception is? First of all, all the Daytonas going to China is just the biggest lie on earth. Like, people need to understand, yes, China is extremely important. Brands don't actually make nearly as much margin in China than they do in pretty much every any other market on earth because the luxury tax is so high in China. Brands yeah. make and they right. undercut okay. they undercut their margins in order to make their prices more competitive compared to other markets around the world. And so because of that they're they're operating on a on a much lower margin in China. And uh, like that's why again Hong Kong is in my opinion forever going to be the watch capital of the world because it's 0% tax, it's a free port. Brands makes, you know, as much money as they can here. I mean, as much money, they make more money here than they do in most markets in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. And so China is extremely important in the sense that there's just a lot of them, a lot of Chinese people, and they make up, you know, I mean, they probably make up 20 to 35, if not more, of percent of the demographic of every brand, I think. Yeah. Um, or ethni- or at least ethnically Chinese people, whether they've, you know, immigrated or whatever. Yeah, and including and, um, tourism sales as well. Yeah. And what people need to realize is Chinese people, they honestly follow the trends of the West. I don't think they build their own trends in any way, shape, or form. They just buy what's cool in the West. But when I say that, they adapt much quicker than any other market in their same situation would have adapted. So for example, Mm -hmm. what I mean by that is Richard Mill became really cool in China two years ago. It only Mm -hmm. became cool in America last year. Yeah. You know what I mean? But Richard Mill became cool in China because with Richard Mill is a little bit different because Chinese celebrities started wearing them way before Western celebrities did. People like Lu Han, who now, uh, is a friend of the brand for AP, but uh, uh, Pan Wei Bo, like all of these, uh, Wilbur Pan, sorry, uh, and Lu Han, like they, they're wearing Richard Mills like years ago and wants to own like China's ex richest guy's son. And they popularized the brand in China and just made it really cool. But when it's popular in China, it goes viral tonight. Everyone wants it tomorrow, you know? Mm-hmm. And so Interesting. with China, I think b- b- besides the Richard Mill trend, in China, they just follow the West, but they catch on much quicker than people, than the brands think that they do. You know what I mean? I think a lot of brands still think China is still China, what it was five years ago, but it's totally different. Five years ago, Chinese people wanted more gold than anything. They wanted more yeah. diamonds than anything. Yeah. Well, now they want Amiga steel. constellations and... Yeah, you know, like exactly. And now, sort of fit in the image. Exactly. And I guess with Asian people in general, I guess, I don't know if this is general, I mean... I am generalizing, but when usually when they get into something, or at least in my experience, they like really dive deep. And I think the same is to be said about watches, but it's also this, this, um, this idea of collectivism and passing something on to the next generation and doing something for the family and doing something where, Oh, it's like for my child or for whatever that really resonates with, collectors in asia it's and a great excuse where, yeah right it's oh it's for my kids <laughs> um, but uh yeah but that's also why right and also in asia a big thing is space um also mm-hmm. in 
in my, I mean, this isn't, this is just from my observations of why I think a lot of people in Singapore, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing love watches, Singapore. Um, and it's because, in my opinion, property is too expensive in these cities. They're amongst, like Hong Kong is one of the most, I think it's the most expensive, it's for some reason not on the list, but it's, uh, I mean, not number one, but it definitely is per square foot in actual usable, usability, I think. Um, and uh, like a million dollars in Hong Kong, like USD can get you like a toilet. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you, you don't have, like, you know, like that's, that's all you can get. And so because of that, I think in these cities, what's really sad is the younger generation, you know, if they're lucky enough to inherit an apartment, then they're fine. Or property but if they're not then what's sad is there's the prospects of upward mobility i think in in these cities are they're not that great you i did the math the other day in shanghai if you were to buy an apartment you literally need to work for like about 100 years Whoa. in order to even afford it. and that's that's if you don't even have any living expenses that's just salary wow. is that, so that's it's like, like the average these, salary yeah. And so it's like, because of that, oh, what'd you say? Sorry. So that's taking like the average salary against the average yeah, yeah, yeah. price. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's like, it's crazy. And um, because of that, it's like, you know, what else can they buy to show face, whatever, uh, watches, cars. That's why these things, cars and watches relatively to property here is dirt cheap compared to the West or the States or you know, I mean, unless you're in like, you know, like New York or LA or Boston or in Australia, if you're not in yeah, Melbourne, Sydney or or Melbourne Indiana, yeah. <laughs> like, like property is not, not too bad. Right. Um, like it's, it's achievable and, um, you know, it just isn't in these cities. And so I think that's part of the, a big reason of what actually also drives this collecting craze here. Yeah. Interesting. Speaking of China, there is, there, there is one, uh, I guess, community I'm interested in learning about how to buy into. That's yeah. the Shanghai Watch Gang. Uh, yeah. Do I have to do any sort of initiation to join? Can I oh. join remotely given that, you know, everyone's I mean, in lockdown? Shanghai Watch Gang, I mean, it's sadly, uh, I don't really run the day-to-day -day at all. Um, I was a co-founder, mm -hmm. uh, but Daniel Sum does and Kelvin do most of the day-to-day -day stuff in terms of like accepting members, uh, vetting and all of that. But it's generally pretty simple. We don't accept brand people mm -hmm. and we don't accept dealers and, or at least dealers that are just dealers for the sake of making money. Cause there are some dealers that I know that are actually very passionate watch collectors. It's just, they happen to sell watches for a living. Yeah. Um, and so those people are fine, but those people are honest about it. They, they're, you know, they're like, yeah, I'm a dealer, but I'm also a collector. Like I have my collection and then I have the stuff that I sell, you know, to pay for the collection. Um, and so, yeah, to pay for his collection yeah. and, um, for their collection. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple, honestly, just to be passionate. We don't, we talk about anything from, you know, vintage watches that the brand no longer, I mean, ceases to exist now to, you know, Crazy Sapphire, Richard Mills, like anything, any price range, swatches, G-Shocks, anything. And uh, the great thing about Shanghai Watch Gang is we all respect. We respect that watch collecting is different. Everyone goes through a different journey and everyone's buying power is different and everyone's tastes are different. But we all appreciate mm -hmm. the art of, and not the art, but the hobby of watch collecting. And there's no right or wrong. It's all subjective and it's all personal taste. And so as long as, you know, that's like the main rule, really. We don't, you, you don't really have any arguments like saying, oh, like that's a shit watch or like, oh, like it's gross or like, you know, like it's very respectful, I guess. That's a nice change. Yeah. It's, I mean, you two, you guys are welcome, obviously. I, I mean, I don't vet, so I'd have to tell Daniel and Kelvin, but I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I'm about to get in. One thing I did want to ask while we've got you on the line, because I think you'll have a really interesting and informed perspective on it. Um, is a watch I believe you own or have owned perhaps, the AP1159. What do mm -hmm. you think of the watch and what do you think of the reaction and what, you know, AP maybe could have done differently or done better around the launch of it? So, I mean, I was at the launch at SIHH, right? Um, I was at the Code 1159 launch event at the then 
in construct. I mean, con- I mean, the museum was there, but it was just concrete, you know. And so the launch event was actually held inside the now museum, mm-hmm. but back then was like a construction site. It was one of the, I think it was the best launch event I've ever been to in my life. Honestly, it was done extremely well. But I think with Code Eleven Fifty Nine, I mean, I've been honest about it from day one. I personally don't like the arabic numeral dials but Mm -hmm. and i think the hands should be a little thicker but besides that i think the case is great the crystal is actually really cool if you see it um in the flesh it's a it's a bitch to photograph but um it looks great in person and i think the code line is uh evolving very nicely um with the newest uh they released um Concurrently with the Royal Oak self-winding foregun, they also released an Adventurine enamel, yeah. uh, Code 1159 uh, self-winding tourbillon, flying tourbillon. And um, I think it's it, it just takes time. I know about 30 or 40 people uh, that own the code, that love it, that don't like the Royal Oak. Interesting. So, oh. I, so I think that the watch community is really misunderstanding the intent of the code. It's to, in my opinion, at least I'm not speaking on behalf of the brand or anything. Um, in my opinion, it's to diversify their clientele and their demographic Yeah. in terms of tastes and preferences, because let's be honest. I mean, prior to the code, like the Royal, uh, the, I mean, Audemars Piguet was synonymous with the Royal Oak, but that was it. Right. Mm-hmm. They needed mm-hmm. more diverse lines. The offshore is, just a bigger, thicker Royal Oak, more sporty. And the concept is still based off of the octagonal bezel, right? Yeah. And um, so the code is something that's completely different. And I think, you know, like, dude, imagine if there's a fucking star wheel in a code case. Oof. That shit would be waitlisted. You know what I mean? It's like AP yeah. is not stupid. Yeah. Like they know what they're doing. And it's only 5% of production last year. And it's about, I think there's a great, um, they're going in the right direction. And I think as long as they continue to innovate on the movements that I've seen, because let's be honest, like from SIH till now, pretty much every movement in the code has been developed specifically for the code and they're new movements. Mm. And that's something that's really cool. And that's something that I hope to see further. Uh, I mean, to see develop further down the line. I mean, whether it's a, other complications like, the classic star wheel or with different dial configurations as you can see now they're experimenting with dials last year was lacquer this Mm. year it's still lacquer but it's like smoked it's like a fume lacquer looks way Um, better yeah it looks way better better, right and so i think um i personally for myself i think the royal oak is one of the i think it's the best design watch of all time so it's very hard to talk bad so personally obviously i still prefer the royal oak but then again i'm a sporty watch guy right so it's natural Very for me cool. to yeah, prefer sense. the Royal Oak, but may but I do know friends. I have, I have a friend that bought the uh, the um, Chrono, and uh, he loves a watch, but he doesn't really like the Royal Oak, same age as me. But what sucks is he doesn't feel comfortable posting it because he's scared that someone's going to be like, "Oh, that's a shit watch." That's what yeah, that's shouldn't be happening. Yeah. That's what should not be happening because he genuine these 30, 40 people I know they genuinely love the watch, but they don't feel comfortable posting it. And going back to what I think, if you ask if AP could have done anything differently, I think obviously the main complaint from people is that they hyped it up so much before the yeah, launch. Okay. But if I were AP, honestly, I wouldn't do anything differently. No one was talking about any other watch at Code Eleven Fifty Nine other I mean, at SIH. 2019 other than the code 1159 mm. and some people about the richard mill bonbon bon collection yeah, every cool. other watch release at sihh 2019 was drowned out in the noise of code 1159 i could not have seen a better launch in terms of exposure than this and it takes time like one year sure people the collector community shat on it for a long time but even now even nyc watch guy the biggest hater of code when they released the open work chronograph tourbillon flying tourbillon he posted it on his feed and was like wow this is great like you know so it just takes time interesting it just takes time like it's it's like that with anything i mean everything takes time 
And I think that's something that people in our age of social media, they want instant gratification for everything. Quick and question. it's just, that's just not how life works. Just, yeah. Just a quick one on that. Do you, so maybe, do you think AP should have launched with that flying turby on first? Would that have changed it or would that have maybe not been as clear? Uh, I don't know. I mean, them launching 13 watches at the same time in a yeah. full collection is pretty crazy. It's a big move. Yeah, exactly. And so I don't, I can't recall any other brand that launched a new line and did that, like with everything, right? Mm. Ballsy, um, ballsy from, move. From, yeah, from a so, time only to a super sonnery. Yeah, they just dropped. They just dropped the whole uh, the whole batch. So I have a question for you, Zoe. That's me flicking through uh, volume seven of Hodinki to page twenty four. Is this who's this? Obviously, young guy? you uh, you you snuck a feature. It was this good looking man dozing off to his left. Snuck a feature in. Uh, I'm curious about how you chose uh, the watch that's on your wrist for this shot. Obviously, it's a it's a pretty big deal for anyone in, into watches to kind of have a feature like this so what are you wearing and, and why did you choose it well this one is simple this is just the china edition on a on the titanium strap so it's just a very versatile watch and so i had to well i didn't have to but i thought it would be fitting to wear the watch that i collaborated with ap on for this shoot Good but well. if you flip the page to mm. those are all my watches too hey, i see on an 1159 page. there yeah yeah i mean i like it supporting right yeah yeah That's i like it i love it that would have been pretty cool uh, i can only imagine um you would have been pretty excited to get that uh, that email yeah um it was a uh, you know it was surreal i mean i'm honestly i am i don't know what i did to deserve the treatment or my journey with ap but i am forever humbled and grateful and i say that from the bottom of my heart because being a watch collector, I remember, you know, when I was 16, 17, gazing into a boutique, uh, the Audemars Piguet boutique and lusting for a Royal Oak to fast forward a few years, being able to actually, for the first time in their history, by the way, collaborating mm. with a collector on a commercial release um, and have Not it actually... Their, uh, was it Boyce, was it not Boyce, it was In Excess edition that they did back in early 2000s, right? They did an In Excess edition? <sighs> I think they did in excess, or I was one of the boy band, not boy bands. Um, in sync, but, but they were, but they were, were still celebrities. I'm a collector. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. It's you know? private. Yeah. Um, it's a fine line now. In sync is a corporation. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's basically and so, a religion. Yeah. It's uh, it's crazy to uh, be able to fast forward now and to have all these people that I that were my idols. I mean, even your. You and Felix, I mean, I was reading your stuff on Time and Tide like ages ago. I remember that. And, you know, it's like being able to call you guys my friends now. Like, that's my greatest achievement. Oh, thank like, you. Everyone, everyone in the community that I viewed as idols and gods and whatever. I still view them as idols and gods, but it's just now they're my friends instead of being Love someone that. that, you know? And so Love that. Yeah, that's the biggest difference. Now... One thing we do uh, at the end of every podcast um, is we, we like to ask you or our guest for a recommendation. Now, I'm not saying that yours has to be NSYNC um, based on the AP tie-in, but is there something you've been listening to or reading or watching that you think that uh, anyone listening to this might appreciate? Yeah. Um, I've, I've been watching a few uh, like docu-series and documentaries on Netflix recently mm -hmm. um dirty money is really good i i love it um <laughs> there's one that i watch i don't know i love i love watching like i love watching documentaries because when i'm watching something i'm like i might as well either not learn anything at all yeah, and yeah. just you know just relax yeah. or i'm gonna learn something and you know and so that's why 60% of the stuff I watch are like docu-series, documentary type stuff. And recently I'm going through a phase where I'm really into this like dirty money, like bad boy billionaires. There's a show called like India's Bad Boy Billionaires or something. That sounds great. And it's really interesting. I mean, these people are all fucking terrible people. But like, I mean, it's, like, it's, just, it's interesting to just see like their journey and like, you know, it, it, it's interesting. So that's that's one thing. Um, reading? Uh 
I haven't been, because I've been so focused on my business, I haven't been reading nearly as much as I should. But the last book I read was Killing Commendator, I think, by Haruki Murakami. Um, when I read, again, it's the same as uh, I, I either go through phases where I just read like nonfiction or go through phases where I just read fiction. And mm-hmm. I'm going through a phase with reading where it's actually just all fiction. Um, so, yeah, it's a uh, that's it's a pretty good book. Um, and yeah, movies. I'm still waiting to see Tenet. I've heard it's good. Oh, yeah, yeah. But other than that, I'm not really that big of a movie guy. I'm more TV show type person. But yeah. Watch um, watch Ted Lasso on uh, Apple TV. How good is it? It's so good. It's so <laughs> wholesome. Like, oh. when I when I watched that show, I just felt like a... I just felt like everything was okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I didn't know what to expect either. I'm like, oh, this is going to be a bit weird and maybe crap, but it, it hooks mm-hmm. me in. Anyway. <laughs> Magic. Well, Austin, thank you so much for joining us. We'll make thank sure we so link up all... Me. It's been our it's been our pleasure. That's uh, at Horror Loop on Instagram. We'll link everything else up. We really appreciate you taking the time, uh, and yeah, stay stay safe, stay happy. You too, and thank you everyone for listening. And I look forward to speaking to you guys again sometime soon. Definitely, so. maybe we'll have to we'll have to see you in person maybe next year. Yes, come come to our uh, our boutique when we launch definitely there's a studio there where we can actually do like podcasts and stuff hey so, we, well that's our new office cool. sorted out yes exactly you'll have your new hong kong office sorted <laughs> Damn. austin what a man what a young uh entrepreneur who's got what seems like a lot ahead of him in a big future uh you know collaborating with ap at such a young age what's yeah. he going to be doing when he's uh when he's 31 fascinating perspectives as well you know like yeah you know just uh, yeah, yeah. you know that, that combination of youth and a lot of experience watch collecting it's really 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 mm. interesting well thank you austin for coming on we'll link up uh his instagram uh not that you need to know it horror loop on uh on ig thank you to uh Longines for sponsoring the episode of course thank you to inglewood coffee roasters as well we still have that uh discount code so use that we'll link it up all throughout the show notes thank you for listening thank you for telling your friends felix if someone wants to email uh you slash me what do they do well, they open up their device or their laptop or their keyboard and they type otpodcast at gmail.com into the relevant field and then hit send. Amazing. And to slide into our slippery DMs? Uh, again, the same deal but with your preferred Instagram app and then hit ot.podcast for the username. Amazing. Well, one last thank you. Who's that? Major Tom Media. Oh, Love you. Tom. Love your work. What a guy. This is the year you get promoted. We're going to do it. It's going to happen yeah. next yeah, episode. We've we just got to get approval from ground control. Mm-hmm. We just have to feed it up the line and then circle back and um, do some other management yeah, talk. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Alrighty, guys. See you later. We will see you next episode whenever that falls.